Welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. This is the show, you ask the questions, we give you the answers. Uh, use the hashtag in the comments underneath, Ask GMBN Tech. Um, and there we go, basically keep it tech related. So first question this week is from Daniel Moody. Doddy, I've just bought a used trials bike, which I think is a quick release rear wheel. However, you need an Allen key to turn it uh, on each side. I've tried to take the back wheel off and one side loosens where the other side just spins around and I can't get it off. Any ideas? Um, you say Allen key on both sides, well the obvious choice, sorry, you might not have thought of this, is an Allen key on both sides uh, against each other. If not, maybe if the other one is stuck, uh, maybe a mole grip, something like that. Um, I'm guessing it's just an axle, 135 in width if it's a rear wheel on the bike and you have, what, a six mil Allen bolt on each side that bolts straight into the axle, so one of them is probably just stuck. Um, give it a good, a good go, basically, and it should hopefully come free. If it doesn't, you might want to try something like a uh, freeze and penetrant sort of spray. Uh, penetrating oil, basically. You spray it on there, leave it overnight, and then try it again. It should work its way into the threads. It might have been something that's not been adjusted for some time, or knowing the fact it's a trials bike and it's key to keeping the tension of the chain in place, it might have just been cranked up ridiculously tight and it's got stuck. Um, so if it has, learn by that and make sure you use some decent grease or even an anti-C, something like a copper compound, which we featured recently. That should hopefully mean it'll go on easier and also come off easier when you need it to. Um, good luck with that. Hopefully that works out for you. Next question is from John Marsland. In 2008, I had a 2003 Kona Kickapow Deluxe in a 16 inch, four inch travel on the rear. Uh, with Manitou Sherman forks, bolt through axle, five inch travel I think, sounds about right for the Sherman. Uh, I had a set of those actually, nice fork with a reverse arch on them. Uh, 50 mil stem and a decent riser bar. It felt like a big BMX. Great fun and quite an upright riding position. I've not had a mountain bike since, we'd like to get back into it. Is there anything you could recommend that would give me a similar feel and a smile on my face? Um, all right, well firstly, bear in mind that bikes have come a long way since then. Wheel sizes have gone up. We're now running 27.5 and 29 inch wheels. Uh, neither is better. They both suit different styles of riding. For what you're looking for, you probably want to consider 27.5. A bit more fun, I would say. Uh, they roll a little bit quicker than what you're used to and go over bumps a bit better as well. So that's only a plus side. The only downside really is what you are talking about is really quite an old school geometry bike. It will be quite a lot shorter and steeper. Now, newer bikes are bigger, but you could downsize if you wanted to achieve the same feel. And the bike I'd recommend straight out, new proof reactor in a 27 and a half inch wheel model. Blake rides that bike. I ride the bigger 290, which has a 29 inch wheel. They're very different bikes. Yeah, all right, they're both still fun, but they perform totally differently. Blake is always out shredding on a 27 and a half inch one, doing supermans and flips and all sorts of crazy stuff. So if you want to play around in the woods and have good fun on a short travel, 27 and a half inch wheel bike, that could be a good one to look at. And they've got a great warranty and they're brilliant value for money as well. So definitely check out Nukeproof. Next up is from Christian Alcus alias. Hi, when I'm not pedaling, my cranks keep on spinning and they won't stop spinning. Uh, when you hold them, they'll put force on, on the wheel. This happens even when the wheel is spinning. It started to happen when I got a pedal strike on asphalt and I don't know what to do. Um, all right, I don't think the pedal strikes anything to do with it. I think that's probably coincidental. Now, it sounds like you've got a sticky free hub body. Now, you bear in mind the free hub body is the ratchet. So if you think about a ratchet spanner, it wants to rotate one way and stop the other way. It's basically the same principle for how your free hub body on a bike works. Now, if that free hub mechanism gets all gunked up with old grease or mud and muck in there, then of course it's not going to ratchet very well, it's just going to want to rotate round. So as the wheel goes round, if it's not enabling it to ratchet, your cranks will go round with that. If you think about rotating the wheel backwards, because it goes the opposite way, it's going to take the pedals round with it. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. So there's two main types of freewheel, and I think what happens is yours has probably got pulls on it because it doesn't tend to happen with the ratchet style free hub. Now, there should be some shots on screen now of a ratchet system, which basically has two rings that interface with each other with springs on either side. They don't tend to get gunked up enough to do what's happening to yours. Whereas the pull style one, uh, it's P-A-W-L, in case you can't understand my funny speaking, um, they've got little tiny springs behind them. And when those springs get gunked up, which does happen, they don't always push back onto the, onto the uh, basically the ring on the inside of the hub. And when it happens, sometimes it can let slip and other times it just sticks, which is probably what's happening to yours. So I think you need to do a free hub body service. Um, I can't remember if we've done that video or not because we've made so many hundreds of videos now. I'm pretty sure Henry did it, in which case it's gonna be a link to it underneath. And if it's not there, uh, let me know about it and I'll make that one next week. Cheers guys. Uh, next up is from Gregory Joseph. 
I'm having tire dilemmas. Okay, right, this could be a long one, folks. I have both an XC and a harder riding trail bike, and to find a jump between them is difficult sometimes. My XC bike has fast tires, and I'll make it as light as possible, but my trail bike has heavier tires to cope with a bit of everything. Yep. Um, every time I switch between them, it takes a bit of time to adjust. The XC bike is fast, but I feel I lose too much in terms of control. And my trail bike feels great with softer and bigger tires, but so slow sometimes uh, that I have to check if I have a puncture. How can I make them both closer? Hmm, okay, all right, this is an interesting point because um, you are between a rock and a hard place here. You're talking about a thing called compromise, unfortunately. Right, so I do actually have a couple of similar bikes. So I've got my Canyon, uh, you can see it on the screen. This is the red bike with the tan wall tires. And I've also got my Nuke Proof. Uh, you can also see this one on screen now. This is the blue one with the bigger Berlier tire. So we'll use these bikes as an example in this question to liken to yours. So on the Canyon, I have cross country race tires. They're extremely light. And the whole point of them is they're very minimal. They roll as fast as possible, just like what you're describing, I think with yours. Um, and as a result, you're gonna be limited in the amount of grip you can get because of the fact that you're maximizing or minimizing rolling resistance, if that makes sense. So you're only gonna ever get a certain amount of grip and stability of a tire like that. Now, they do, so those tires of Victoria have got a Mezcal on the rear, so I'm just looking at them, and a Barzo on the front currently. Now, they also make those in a trail casing, so you can have a heavier duty casing, which enables you to run them at a lower pressure and achieve more grip. Now, I could do that on that bike, but I'm actually quite happy to sacrifice a bit of grip, which doesn't sound like you are, in terms of rolling speed. Now, I'm not sure I'd run that combination of tires in winter, like I'm loving them in summer, and I'm quite happy to be sliding around a bit, as in, you know, as and when I need to, but probably for winter, I'd need to run the trail casing in those in order to lower the tire pressure to get that spread of grip that you would need. But of course, going with that, the bike's gonna roll slightly slower. So there is a compromise you always have to do. And with regards to the trail bike, uh, excuse me if I'm pointing this way because I'm actually looking at them while I'm talking to you. With a trail bike at the moment, I'm actually in a bit of a honeymoon period with a set of tires. This is quite unlike me. So I've got their new Mazza tire on there. So that's like an all round aggressive trail tire and I'm running the front and rear. Now, normally anyone that knows me will tell you this. I never run the same tire front and rear. I always chop and change. Now, typically I'll run a faster rolling tire on the rear for the exact reason that you're trying to get around because I don't mind if I slide around a bit and break traction. I've been riding long enough that I, I know what I can sacrifice in terms of uh, traction grip on the trails in order to roll faster. So I'll always have a faster tire on the rear. And in fact, the tire you can see on screen now is called Nagaro. That's what I normally run on the rear. As you can see, it won't be brilliant in the mud. It's not supposed to be, but I don't mind that because it rolls faster. So I tend to I compromise by sacrificing some grip in uh, the trade-off is to make them roll quicker. And I'll normally keep something like that new Mazda, as you can see here on the front end. So I've got maximum traction and grip and braking power on the front, which makes you feel really confident. And on the rear, it's a bit quicker. But somewhere in the middle, actually, I think is what you want. And, and I don't see where you can get that without a trade-off. Like that, you're looking for something incredibly lightweight that rolls fast, that grips loads, that doesn't exist. You can only pick like two of those things. So the answer would be to go in the middle, I guess you could do the trail option in a cross-country tread tire. That might give you a bit more stability, but you will have uh, a weight hindrance to that and of course, a traction hindrance to that uh, as well, because you're not gonna get any more traction by doing that, but you will by lowering the pressure, but then of course it's gonna roll slightly slower. So up to you if you wanna do that, but you could do what I do on my trail bike and normally run a fast tire on the rear. That's definitely gonna make bridging between the two bikes slightly different. Uh, something else you could do as well, which I've not done, is try a tire insert on your cross country bike that would enable you to lower the pressure in your tire slightly and still get a bit of support. So you can get a bit more traction out of them, but hopefully not lose much in the way of rolling resistance. Uh, that is something I do want to try on there. I have got some inserts. So to be honest, I just don't generally bother with them, but I do feel like I need to try that. Now, sorry, a bit of a long way around the question here, but it's all about compromise, unfortunately, with tires. There is no perfect choice if you're going between two different types of bike. It's just too much variant in there. Okay, next question is from Noah Westfall. Hey Dolly and Henry, I recently bought a new mountain bike and it's got a straight steerer tube. And for some reason, the fork moves in the headset. I'm wondering if an O-ring or bearing might be missing or if I just need to tighten the top cap or pinch bolts. I bought the bike a few months ago and I've not taken the fork off or anything like that, but it's not safe for the fork to move back and forth like that. Okay, well firstly, if you bought the bike you know, as a new bike, then really you need to take it back to the bike shop. They shouldn't have sold it to you in that state, but I'd imagine that you might not have done, which is why you're asking us about this. 
So it could be the headset is loose. That is a classic thing to check first. So undo those two pinch bolts. They could be a four, a five, or maybe a six mil on the side of your stem. Just loosen them off so your stem can move side to side. And then it will be a five millimeter Allen key bolt on the top. Now just tighten that up. Now we're not talking about hanging off the Allen key here. You're talking about taking up the slack that's in the headset. That's all that does to preload those bearings. In fact, you're not actually preloading the bearings even as could preload. You're literally just taking up any slack and movement that's in there. You don't actually want to put any load on those bearings because otherwise you can damage them. So if that tightens up snug, you'll find that that play should remove. And then after that, you would then adjust those pinch bolts on the side when your stem is straight and then job done. However, if it's not doing that, you need to assess whether you need a headset spacer in there or if there's a part of the headset missing. So the way to tell if a part of the headset missing is you can tighten it and the headset's actually getting tight or if it still has movement and you're fully bottomed out, in which case there might be a shim or an O-ring or something missing. Um, you'll need to take it all apart, lay it all out on the desk and actually see what the manufacturer suggests for that particular model. But it's more likely to be, if you got the bike second hand, it might be missing a small spacer. We're talking about a really small spacer here, like five mil, they come in 10 and five mils, sometimes twos as well. And the way to check that is to remove that top cap and see where the steerer tube is in line with the top of the stem. Now, ideally there should be a three or four millimeter gap between the top of the stem and the top of the steerer tube. And when you basically tighten that uh, five mil bolt on the top, that gives you the room for error so it can pull the steerer tube up like fractionally, we're talking like a millimeter here, to take up any play. If it's flush with the top, then there's your problem. It can't actually take up any of slack, which is why it's moving around. So if that's the case, you're gonna need another spacer on there. Uh, it's worth getting yourself some spacers anyway because they will always come in handy at some point down the line. Or you can help a friend with them and only cost two or three quid. You can get them online, get them from your local bike shop, get them on eBay, anything like that. Um, and they're really your choices, I think, for checking that out. So um, good luck with that and hopefully that answers your problem. Okay, and the last question this week is from Dean Powell. Hi Doddy and Henry, I'm a big fan of the show and I've got a question concerning my rear shock. Uh, it's a RockShox Monarch RT, uh, it gives my bike 120 mil travel. I started a recent tune up to the bike as I wasn't getting anywhere near full travel and I've increased the sag um, to nearly 40% and I've reduced the air pressure to 95 psi to get anywhere near full travel. Do you know what, that's quite a tricky one. I'm not sure I can sort of diagnose this one because of the fact there's too many little variants here. Um, all right, first question is, is it the original shock for the bike? If it's not the original shock for the bike, the problem could be there. Uh, typically when a bike manufacturer designs a bike, the designer will have put the suspension curve for a program and they'll know the sort of shock specs they need. So when, you, when you're buying a shock, you do the eye to eye measurement, that's from the eyelet to eyelet, the physical length. You'll do the shaft stroke on there, could be a 57 mil, that's how much travel the shaft has. Then there will be the compression and rebound tune for that shock. This particular one says custom tune ID CP32. Now they're gonna be different for every shock for every different bike out there. And when a bike manufacturer, let's just say Scott, when they manufacture say the Genius, they'll know which they need from which manufacturer. So they'll go to Rock Shocks and they'll be like, yeah, we need this compression tune with this rebound tune, this eye to eye with this, um, this shaft travel and they'll order however many they need for their bikes. That's how it works. So if you've managed to get hold of a shock that's not the right tune for your bike, that could be part of the problem because it might have too much compression. If it's the correct shock for your bike and you're still getting this problem, well, A, there could be physically something wrong with the shock hindering it internally, in which case I don't know because I can't see the shock. It could be you've got too many air volume spaces in there, so they're limiting the amount of travel you can get. You can actually fit too many air volume spaces and actually stop you getting full travel. But usually they make the travel ramp up so the last bit is really hard to get. That said, on a 120 mil travel bike, they tend to be slightly more linear to make them feel plusher. Um, so I kind of don't think it would be that. Now you say you're running 95 PSI, you're getting 40% sag. Um, which isn't ideal. You don't really want to have more than 25 to 30% sag because your bike will just sit a bit lower, which means you can strike your pedals and it messes up your geometry a little bit. And you, it sounds like you're still you're not getting full travel. So it makes me wonder if there is a problem with the shock itself. Uh, it's worth deflating the shock completely. Now with a rock shock, shock, the reason I'm puzzled by this, you say you've got 95 PSI in there to achieve 40% sag. Rock shocks typically recommend inflating their shocks to 100 PSI and then you cycle them through the travel a few times. And then basically what that does is it lets the air go from the positive into the negative chamber to equalize the shock. And then you would set your sag from that point. Now, 
your sag typically is done in body weight so um, I'm about 200 pounds so I should in theory put 200 psi and of course it's a ballpark figure it's going to change the different bikes by your count it suggests that uh, all right well 40 percent sag so it suggests you're about 110 pounds I reckon which is quite light um, it might be that you are quite light but alarm bells are ringing for me that there is a problem with the shock in which case your best advice really would be to call your nearest shock specialist or preferably just go to the bike shop give them to have a look at it and they might give you an opinion in the flesh um, if anyone out there has had a similar thing with the RockShox Monarch RT i.e you're not getting full travel and you're running loads of sag uh, let us know in those comments to see if we can figure this one out um, alternatively um, Dean, if you've got any more information, the bike, the model of bike, uh, anything else you can share with us, let us know in those comments. We'll see if we can figure that one out. Interesting. Um, come on, community, do your thing. We love it when you all get involved down there. As always, make sure you keep those questions coming in. Use the hashtag AskGMBNTech, and um, we'll see you next week. Thanks, as always. See you later.